the multivariate calculus study guide a manual for maple's syntax free approach to multivariate calculus it was originally an ebook separate from maple but since the release of maple 2021 it's been incorporated into the help system so every recent copy of maple contains the guide anyone with an earlier copy of maple wanting access to the guide should contact customer support or sales to see what options exist for obtaining the ebook so what is this guide it's a supplement to a multivariate calculus course where maple is thought to be a useful adjunct it's not designed as a replacement for a standard calculus text however it demonstrates how maple augments a multivariate calculus course and it implements the syntax free approach that maple calls clickable calculus so it's going to illuminate the material and it's going to illustrate how this improved learning is implemented without the need for first mastering syntax so we'll show you how to access the guide and then we'll sample enough of it so you can decide if the benefits uh, are worth the acquisition so let's browse through the guide a bit so imagine that you've just walked into a bookstore or a library or a faculty lounge and there's a bookshelf or a table with this book on it uh, you haven't seen it before so you pick it up and you find a place to sit down you start flipping the pages to see if the book looks interesting enough to continue with it well, what's the book jacket got to say? Well, this might be what you would see. So this, this is a supplement. It's not intended to replace the textbook. Just enhance it. It will serve as a manual for implementing multivariate calculus in Maple using all of the syntax-free tools. It's got 76 sections. And the way they're set up is there is a summary of what's essential to recall in your in a study from a textbook. And then there are worked out examples. And there's more than 700 worked out examples. And each is solved in up to three ways. There's a mathematical solution written the way it would appear in a textbook with no maple showing in it. Then there's the syntax free Maple solution, and there is even a solution using Maple commands for those who want to see uh, how the commands work. Well, what are the features might you glean from flipping front to back? There are nine chapters, and there's an appendix. Each section is written in a document it's typeset 2d math so the math is live and executable and it illustrates and uses clickable calculus those tools those interactive tools are listed here palettes embedded components test templates tutors assistance the context panel so you learn how to use all of those uh, tools a paradigm exists in which the math and the maple are separated we do not use maple to convey mathematical content wherever mathematical content needs to be conveyed it's done as if it were a textbook with no maple showing the maple is in uh, the solution of exercises and throughout there's an attempt to resequence concepts and skills. In other words, emphasis is on.
first learning the concept, the skills are then presented. Well, if you're still curious at this point, the next thing that you would probably do is look at the table of contents. And then you might look at some of the examples. And there are a lot of examples. Um, we might have time for six, seven. I prepared one from every chapter. Well, let's see how to access the guide in a copy of Maple. So this is a live demo. There's no uh, nothing written here about how to do it. I'm going to show you how to do it. Click this question mark, which opens the help system. Now down here, you will see education. And under it, you'll see study guides. But within education, you see study guides. And what's in this subfolder is exactly the same as what's in this folder. So I'm going to use this folder because it's easier to access. And you'll see that there are, there's more than one study guide. And we're talking about the multivariate calculus study guide. Now, you can access the various chapters and the sections and the examples from here from the help page but there is a table of contents and that provides access to all of the sections and chapters and examples and that's what I'm going to use so this is the table of contents this table of contents is in roughly the same order that you would find in a textbook. First unit on vectors, lines, and planes, is, that's the linear stuff. Then you curve things, so you get space curves. Then functions of several variables, partial differentiation with applications, double integration with applications, triple integration with applications, and a chapter on vector calculus. And there's even an appendix which contains material that uh, would be familiar to a previous user of Maple, but for a new user, uh, it's explanatory stuff about how to use Maple. So inside chapter one, you can see what the sections are Cartesian. Then some vector arithmetic, dot and cross products, applications of vector algebra, and then lines in space and planes. Chapter two, space curves. Well, you position vector, arc length as a parameter, tangent vectors, curvature, principal normal, binormal, and torsion. For Nasere formalism, resolution of the second derivative along the tangent and normal vectors, applications to dynamics. Chapter 3, functions of several variables. Functions, their graphs, limit and continuity, and the quadric surfaces. Chapter 4, partial differentiation and its application. So first order derivatives, higher order, chain rule, directional derivative, gradient vector, surface normal, tangent plane, approximations, unconstrained optimization, constrained optimization, optimization on a closed domain, and the notion of differentiability. Chapter 5 on double integration. So definition, iterated, regions with curved boundaries, changing the order of iteration, numeric, changing variables, then polar coordinates. Chapter six is the application of the double integral. So you have area, volume, surface area, average value, first and second moments. Chapter 7, triple integrals. What it is, iterated, 
regions with curved boundaries, integration in cylindrical coordinates, spherical coordinates, what are they, and integration in spherical coordinates. Chapter 8, Applications of Triple Integral, Volume, Average Value, First Moments, Second Moments, which are Moments of Inertia, and then Changing Variables in a Triple Integral. Chapter 9 is an introduction to vector calculus. The work is in the student vector calculus package, what's in it. Then you have some definitions. What are the vector objects? What are the operators? You have identities. Then you have line integrals and surface integrals, conservative and solenoidal fields, the divergence theorem, Stokes theorem, Green's theorem. And finally, the appendix. And you can see that it's an overview of things that you can do in Maple. Arithmetic calculations, how do you reference things, algebraic expressions and operations, how do you evaluate something, how would you do coordinate geometry and trigonometry, what are functions in Maple, how do you draw graphs, how do you solve equations, how do you factor and collect terms. These are the things that one would pick up using Maple, and for someone who has not used Maple before, this might be useful. Let's take a quick look at one of the sections. How about section 1.5? So, so this is uh, one of the sections on vectors, lines, and planes, applications of vector products. And what you see here is the way these sections are split between essentials and examples. The essentials are the things that the user should recall from their study from their textbook. You can see here in this particular case, we have a list of vector uh, expressions. And down here you would see a list of examples. So here is the example, and this is a hyperlink to a page where that example is solved. Now let's look at some of the examples that I've compiled back here in this table. I've got these hyperlinks to simplify the hunt through the table of contents to reach the examples that I picked out and decided I would use. So essentially there's one example from each chapter. Chapter 1 has two examples. In example 164, we're computing the distance from a point to a line. So here's the point. Here is the line given vectorially, where A is the point given as a vector, and this is the direction vector for the line. By way of solution, you'll notice that there are three solutions given. The first is a mathematical solution that would look like a textbook solution. So here you have a figure, this is a line, this is the direction vector V, point A, point P. Pick this point uh, A and obtain the vector U from A to P. Project that black vector onto V. Its projection is this little green vector here. U here, perp, is the orthogonal component of the vector U. The length of that vector is the distance. And here are the calculations that correspond to that picture done in uh, a textbook style notation, computations, proceed the way they would proceed in a textbook. The interactive maple solution begins with uh, getting the student multivariate calculus package loaded where you have access to the commands to deal with lines and planes. So here I am 
defining the line here I'm getting the distance from the point of the line this is done with uh, the context panel right click menu if the package is loaded these actions are available through the context menu obtain the distance in exact arithmetic here it is floated the traditional solution that you'd find in a textbook proceeds this way uh, define a p and v as vectors obtain the vector u and then get the norm of the orthogonal component this is what we stated from the diagram shown in the mathematical solution there's a task template that will help us here now clicking this button will launch the task template here is the path to the task template let's take a quick look at task templates tools tasks browse and this is the table of contents and you can see here the path you go to linear algebra then down in visualizations projection plot 1d this is the task template it's inserted by clicking one of these two insert buttons this gives you all of the verbiage and this gives you enough to make the test template work it's already here it's filled in vector to be projected projected onto v this is the diagram you would like to have available you can see the black vector is the vector you are trying to project you project it down onto the green vector the orthogonal component is the red vector so here is the projection this is the orthogonal component you grab the orthogonal component you compute its norm this the same answer that we got before let's just click this to see what happens that test template pops up so you can see what it is that uh, you can make use of and finally there's the coded solution where we use maple commands so you can see what those commands are like so here we use the line command from the student multivariate calculus package we use the distance command from that package and that gives us the length of that vector u perp and evalf is the floating point command down here we do a, a more traditional way we have the vectors a p v and u defined uh, this is the orthogonal component of the vector that we want to project down and we use the norm command to obtain uh, the length so here are the commands that are being used under the hood in the maple solution the second example from the first chapter we can access from this table and this is the problem of obtaining the equation for a plane containing three given points the mathematical solution this problem is based on this little diagram here you see a plane that we're looking for these are the uh, position vectors to the three given points by subtraction you get the green and the red vector take the cross product you get a normal that's the normal to the plane you've now got the normal you have at least one point 
here are the calculations. First, you have to make some uh, subtractions to get various points, uh, various vectors. Then you take the cross product, you get the normal, and here is the uh, vector form of the equation of the plane. Here's the equation of the plane. The interactive solution can be implemented this way. I'm going to actually load the student multivariate calculus package so you can see some of these steps. Make a sequence of the three points. Go here to the context panel. You see student multivariate calculus package. Lines and planes. Select plane. Here, let's select plane. You make the plane. Well, the plane is an object. Actually, uh, I think it's a module in, in Maple. Uh, it's a basket containing all the properties of that plane. You can then query it for different things. And here I've queried it for representation. That gives me the equation of the plane. So there's a, a quick glimpse of how uh, with point and click you can uh, obtain some of these computations. What did not pop up when I just did this now is uh, this dialog which allows you to uh, give names to the coordinate variables. The defaults are XYZ. I keep them as XYZ for most work, and that's just fine. The traditional approach to this problem is to form uh, the vectors uh, that you want to take the cross product of by subtraction. So here I'm defining the vectors, the position vectors ABC. This is the generic position vector. Um, here are the two vectors P and Q that are formed by subtraction. Here is the cross product. Here is the equation, the vector equation of the plane. It matches what we got earlier. And here is a display of these vectors so you can see what they actually are. This interactive solution contains an, another approach to the problem, analytic approach, that contains a trick that's of great use in Maple. We want to define here a scalar valued function of a vector argument. Now, the name of the argument here in the definition is V. So the components, V1, V2, V3, of that vector become the XYZ of the definition of the plane. And the definition is done through the context panel go here to the context panel, you see assign function. So all of the machinery of forming that function is done by simply clicking. And here are the steps that you can perform. That function, when you evaluate it at the points A, B, and C, has to be zero because you want A, B, and C to satisfy the equation of the plane. So there are four equations uh, three equations in four unknowns, but really, really there's three unknowns because one of these letters, A, B, C, and D, has to be non-zero, and you can divide by it. So really, really, you can solve for A, B, and C in terms of D, and here you can see how using the context panel, you have these equations here, context panel, there is a solve option in the solve option, you pick the way you want to solve. So you solve for the variables, and you can state the variables A, B, and C. There is a substitute into option. Here you go to the context panel. You see substitute into. A dialog comes up, and you say, I want to substitute this into F of R equals 0. The simplest way to deal with the D in each term is to give it a, a nice value. Uh, I've chosen to give it the value negative 86. 
that takes care of all these denominators, and you get the equation of the plane. The coded solution, making use of Mabel commands, is a little bit more compact. Here we have used the plane command from the multivariate calculus package. It's applied to the a sequence of the three points. And then we wrap that with the get representation command. So all you see is the equation of the plane. The traditional approach, you would define the vectors a, b, c, and the position vector r. There's a dot product command and a cross product command. So here you're taking the cross product of the difference of the vectors that produces the two vectors you want to take the cross product of, take the cross product of those vectors, and this is the dot product that you see in the vector equation of the plane, and again, you get the equation of the plane. Now, an example from chapter 2, we obtain from here, from this little table, looking at arc length as a parameter. So here's the problem. We want to get the arc length function for a given curve. And we want to solve the arc length function for the parameter as a function of arc length so that we can form the position vector as a function of arc length. And we want to show that the derivative dr ds, which is a tangent vector, has length 1. And you can do that for very few functions, and this is one of the functions for which you can do these calculations in closed form. The mathematical solution for part A obtains the arc length function. So this is a graph of the curve, just for enlightenment. The integrand of the arc length function is the norm of r prime or dr dp. This is calculated here. The arc length function is that integral, and in part b we want to invert this. Mathematical solution for part b, where we obtain the curve parametrized by arc length. So first there's the inversion step, so you have to do a solve, pick the right branch, and then evaluate r at p of s. So here is the uh, expression that you get. You simplify it, and you now have r as a function of arc length. The mathematical solution for part C shows that you need to take the derivative of R of S with respect to S. You get this. Then you need its norm squared. So there's some algebra involved. Simplification says you get 1. The interactive Maple solution for part A works in the student multivariate calculus package. So here it is loaded. Here we have defined R as a position vector. And the computation we want to perform here is first take the derivative with respect to the given parameter, get its norm use norm bars. You can right click. Well, we need to do some of this stuff. So let me let me uh, activate a few of these things here and then you can see uh, how the context panel provides the information you want. This is uh, the derivative operator is an operator that comes from the calculus palette. So let's take a look at the calculus palette. Here you calculus palette, you have a derivative operator. That's where that's coming from. Uh, let's see over here. We want to look at 
the simplify command and the simplify command has options and I've taken assume positive or assuming positive so that's how we get this expression then uh, we integrate that using the context panel there's an integrate option here okay and then you can go to constructions and you'll find definite integral here and so definite integral zero to some upper endpoint this is the expression you get in terms of this letter for the upper endpoint but we want that to be a p so we just write this expression in terms of p so part b is where the curve is described in terms of the arc length as a parameter so this is s as a function of the given parameter p you invert that so you need a solve there are two solutions you take the one that stays positive so here is the curve r given as a position vector in terms of p and we want to make a substitution into that so here we can make use of the context panel evaluate at a point a pop-up appears uh, in that pop-up you can indicate what is to be substituted you end up with this which requires a simplify it comes down to this and there is r as a function of s and we call it rs in port c we want to show that the derivative with respect to arc length yields a vector whose length is 1. So here's the differentiation operator from the calculus palette, You're differentiating this vector, you uh, taking the norm, not the norm square, you take the norm, you use a norm bar from the keyboard, get this expression, you want to simplify that, hit it with a simplify you get one now to do this with commands part a you are obtaining s as a function of t which you would change to s as a function of p so here is r you take its derivative with the vector p, compute its norm, and integrate that from 0 to t. There's the expression for s as a function of this upper limit t, and you write, instead of t, you write p. Now in part b, we want to get position vector r as a function of arc length so we need to do this inversion so there's a solve you have two um, solutions you pick the correct branch and you can pick that by uh, the position indicator number one it's this one you take r and evaluate it at p equals this expression and you simplify and this is r s the position vector of the curve given as a function of arc length in part c we want to show that the derivative is a vector of length one when you take the derivative with respect to arc length so here is the vector r as a function of the arc length s we want to differentiate it with respect to s we want to compute its norm you might need to simplify it you do get one the next solution or next example we'll look at is graphing a quadric surface so here is a quadratic in XYZ we want to put it into the standard form for a quadric 
surface, identify the surface, draw the graph of the surface, and take a look at the level curves and plane sections. Mathematical solution for this example takes the given equation and puts it into the standard form of a quadric by completing the square in x, y, and z. The details of com completing the square uh, are not spelled out because they're done computationally uh, further down. Level curves, or some people call them level sets, I like to call them level curves. They're circles, cross sections, x is constant, y is constant, a hyperbolas, and this slider controls the animation of the cutting plane that demonstrates the hyperbolas that you get on the surface of this double cone. The interactive solution makes use of some tools, maple tools, in particular the equation manipulator. So here is the equation and the equation manipulator is launched when you click manipulate equation. This is what the equation manipulator looks like. A uh, checkbox here so that each new equation is written one under the other. You see there is a complete the square option down here. You click on the do and it, the step is, is taken. So the complete the square steps can be done in the equation manipulator. The surface can be drawn with the plot builder, and here are the instructions for making use of the plot builder. So there's the equation. Here you can pick up the plot builder from here. Click on the graph, you get the plot builder on the left, and you can see what the stage directions are. You make the adjustments here. You can f formulate this graph via the plot builder. The maple solution done with commands would look like this. Here is the given expression, give it a name, use the complete square command from the student precalculus package. It can complete the square in several variables at once, and then two operations to put this precisely into standard form. This is a plotting command. It's in the plots package. This command will render the graph of that surface, and it will show the level curves. Now, a problem from Chapter 4, Applications of Differentiation, is this. You have a surface and a point. We are to obtain and draw the normal and the tangent plane at that point. Mathematical solution shows piece of the surface tangent plane, normal vector. Calculations are shown here. This is where you compute the normal vector. There it is. Vector equation of the plane, of the tangent plane. And that's implemented here. And it results in this equation of the tangent plane. For the Maple Interactive Solution, we would have the following. Load the student calculus package, define the function f as a function, and the point q. Now, we're going to make use of the partial differentiation operator 
from the calculus palette. Here we have a vector template minus fx minus fy1. This will give us a normal vector to the explicitly given surface z equals f of x and y. We get this vector. We have to evaluate it at the point Q. So we make use of the context panel evaluate at a point. We get this resulting vector. We give it the name n. It's the normal vector. To get the plane, tangent plane, this is the point Q. This is the normal vector n. We make the plane. So we've gone here to the context panel to where it says, uh, yeah, let's do that. Load this thing. Then um, define the function, get the point, normal vector. So now you should see student multivariate calculus lines and planes and you pick plane. That brings you to this point. It is the plane object and then when you click on that, you know, let's redo this line. When you click on that, student multivariate calculus, lines and planes, you can get the representation. There's the plane. A solution from first principles in this same section. Type the name Q. Q has already been defined as this point, but we want to convert that to a vector. Uh, so I think we need conversions here to a column vector. And we give it the name A. So that we can here define the generic position vector, then use the vector equation for a plane, point A, which is Q, and the normal vector, there's the equation of the plane. Coded solution. Well, using commands. So you use with student multivariate calculus. And then you define the function, the, the, the syntax for that. And I've used an arrow syntax. Name of the function, the rule. All right, now I want to get the normal vector. So minus fx, minus fy1. So minus diff, minus diff, angle brackets for a vector. Then evaluate that vector at x equals 2, y equals minus 3 give it or assign it to the name n. We can use the plane and get representation commands from the student multivariate calculus package. So you form the plane. This is the point. There's the normal vector. You wrap that with get representation. There's the plane. Alternatively, in the student vector calculus package, there is a tangent plane command. Give it the function or the expression, either way. This, yeah, this results in an expression. Location. And you get a parametric representation of the tangent plane. X is X, Y is Y, Z is this expression in X and Y. From the chapter on double integration, we have an integral over a triangle. So here are the vertices of the triangle. We ought to integrate the simple function over that triangle because this is not a right triangle with the legs parallel to the coordinate axes, it's going to take two integrals. And then we consider this change of variables, which rectifies that triangle. 
and then we integrate again and we compare. The mathematical solution shows the following. This is the triangle in the xy plane, the given triangle. Under the change of coordinates indicated, that triangle will become this triangle in the uv plane. The equations of the edges are here in the xy plane. The mappings back and forth between xy and uv are indicated here. This is the mapping from uv back to xy. And these are the equations for the mapping from xy to uv. You'll need a Jacobian, so we compute a Jacobian. This is the integral done in the xy plane. It takes two double integrals. This is the integral done in the uv plane. You'll need the absolute value of the Jacobian. Uh, it was minus 5 here. It's 5 here. Both numbers agree. For the syntax-free solution, we proceed as follows. We need to initialize some stuff, so load the student multivariate calculus package. This is a list of lists. These are the three points. We can refer to them individually as P1, P2, P3. This is the integrand. These are the equations of the transformation from x, y to u, v. We need the equation of the edges of the triangle in the x, y plane. So a pair of points. Uh, we use the context panel, make line, get representation, and then we isolate this for y because we want to see the edges in the form y equals. And I've given them the the names, these equations have, have names. So you have to do that two more times. The integration in the xy plane requires two double integrals. The double integral template uh, you can get from the calculus palette. D double integral, definite integral, iterated here. Use that. Fill it in 160 over 3. Now we change coordinates. So you'll notice I have these two statements. Little u equals big U. Little, u, little v equals big V. And now you'll see here that when I wrote these e transformation equations, I used a big U and a big V because I want little u and little b, v to remain as variables. So this is the variable, this is the expression. This is the variable, this is the expression. Variable, expression, variable, expression. Okay, and I want to solve this pair of equations for x and y. So here's x equals, y equals, in terms of u and v. And I give this set of equations the name capital S. So then I'm, I want to pick out this expression 2v plus 3u plus 1. So I evaluate the letter x using this set of equations, and it picks out the right-hand side. I give that the name uppercase x. Notice again here, lowercase is a free variable. Uppercase is an expression. Same thing for y. Then I make this list x and y. So it's the list of these two expressions. Right? So it's taking these right-hand sides and making a list. There is in the context panel here the opportunity to get a Jacobian. This pop-up comes up. You fill it in. You get the determinant because you want the Jacobian, not the Jacobian matrix. And here, just for completeness, I get the Jacobian by first principles. du on xy, dv on xy, you get this matrix, get its determinant, minus 5. 
then you transform each of the edges in the xy plane this edge transformed by those equations here x becomes this y becomes that clean it up you get v equals 0 on this one you get u equals 0 those are the two legs of the right triangle in the uv plane and this is the hypotenuse v equals 1 minus u then you transform the integrand into, from xy to uv I gave it the name uppercase F so I'm integrating 5 which is the absolute value of the Jacobian times F dv du I'm going this way from 0 to 1 minus u 1 0 to 1 and I get 160 over 3 so this is an example where you integrate in xy you make a transformation to uv and you integrate in uv if you do everything right you get the same answer the coded solution looks like this so we bring in the student multivariate calculus package using the with command abc the uh, vertices of the triangle in the xy plane are given separate names uh, the integrand in the xy plane is a function defined with the arrow notation u and v are those transformation equations are defined as functions the edges of the triangle in the xy plane here are their names and we get them by using the line command from the student multivariate calculus package and wrapped with a get representation and then isolate so that you end up with equations in the form y equals takes two integrals so we use the int command this is the inert int command there is the integrand these are the bounds for the integral you have two integrals get 160 over 3 because this is inert, we hit it with a value, that's how you get the 160 over 3. Now change coordinates and operate over in the UV plane. So how do we do that? Well, we need the equations little u equals big U, little v equals big V. We solve those for x and y, and we give the uh, set of equations that come back the name uppercase S. So then we want the right hand sides and we use that same trick evaluate x and y using this information and it picks out the right hand sides and they sit together in a list called L. Now Jacobian will produce the Jacobian matrix. Jacobian if you say output equals determinant you will get the determinant which we saw to be minus 5. Now we need to transform the edges of the triangle in the xy plane to their equivalent over in the uv plane. So we evaluate the edge using this information for how x and y transform. Do a little manipulation. This is the edge v equals 0. This is the edge u equals 0 and this becomes the hypotenuse v equals 1 minus u. You transform the integrand, so there it is in uv coordinates, and here is the integral, 5, which is the absolute value of the Jacobian, the integrand here, f, integrated over that right triangle in the uv plane, inert integral value of that 160 over 3 our example in chapter 6 is this one volume of a region in space so we have an upper bound a function of two variables 
and that sits over a region in, in the plane and that region in the plane is bounded by these lines y is this parabola the x-axis so we want the volume enclosed now in example 6.1.1 that region is graphed so let's just peek at the graph I think it's drawn here there is the region in the xy plane over which we will integrate both dy dx and dx dy well to get to the mathematical solution of the problem at hand we see the region in space that we are going to compute the volume of xy is the upper bound so you're going to integrate from zero to that upper bound and then you're going to integrate over that base region that we saw in the, in the previous example. Here I've done a dy dx, and here I've done a dx dy, and we get the same value. Maple's interactive solution has some interesting tools. Student multivariate calculus package. Make two assignments here. This is the bounding curve in the xy plane. This is the uh, surface above these assignments are made through the context panel you just use here assign name anticipating that we're going to integrate the x dy dy dx we will need at some point x as a function of y so we write the equation defining the curve the parabola in, in the xy plane we solve for x as a function of y there are two branches that sequence is called x and you can refer to the individual branches by x1 and x2 then you come down here and you write the the name uppercase f evaluate and display in line which you can uh, see here in the context panel or the keyboard equivalent is control equal which is what i always use so that echoes back xy in the context panel, student multivariate calculus, integrate, iterated, you get a pop-up which lets you set the bounds for the integral. This is the dy dx integral. It evaluates to 1 over 120. Here we have set the integral from first principles using the calculus palette. Here uh, the iterated double integral. I might as well leave that one open iterated double integral this is dy dx so for dy dx this lowercase f is known it's it's this right hand side the parabola for dx dy you have to integrate from one branch of the parabola to the other and you can reference those branches as x1 and x2 so you again get the 1 over 120. Here's another useful tool in the realm of syntax free computing. It's a task template. Here's the path to the task template. We've seen how, how to find something in, in that index of task templates. This is visualizing regions of integration. Here you have the choice of dy dx or dx dy. This would be an integrand. Well, our integrand is f. These are where you would put the bounds 0 to f, 0 to 1. You get the exact value here, and you get a picture, your graphs. This arrow is telling you, you that you are integrating in the xy plane uh, dy first. And this then is the picture that these bounds correspond to. And that's the picture we want to see. So 
that's a feedback that tells you you probably have this thing set up correctly. This same task template will allow us to integrate dxdy. Just make this change here. The integrand will be the same, but the bounds now can be referenced uh, with x1 and x2. With those bounds, this picture tells you you are integrating dx first. One bound here, the other bound here, and you get a corresponding picture of the region that corresponds to what we saw earlier. Again, it's feedback telling us that uh, we have correctly set up this dx dy integral. For the coded solution using commands, we use take a look at se several different commands. If you work within the multivariate calculus package, define the upper surface, get the branches so that you can integrate dx dy. And here we have int with an uppercase letter and int with a lowercase letter. With the uppercase letter, you get the unevaluated integral. With the lowercase letter, you get immediate evaluation. So you get a statement that says this integral has this value. Notice the syntax. You're integrating from 0 to this upper bound here. And here is the region the xy plane described. And notice these brackets, square brackets. If you use the multi-in command, you apply it to the same function f. The bounds in the xy plane are the same, but no square brackets. The multi-in command, when executed, will give you an immediate evaluation. If you put output equals integral, you will get see the unevaluated integral. If you put output equals steps, you will get a stepwise evaluation of this double integral. There are other features in a multi-int command that are worth knowing. Multi-int understands some predefined regions, and in fact, they're the same regions that integration in the vector calculus package knows. And the way you would use it, x, y in brackets, so that defines the variables. One of the options here is region. You describe the region over which you are integrating this function f, and then the uh, options are the same. No option, get the answer. Output equals integral, you get the unevaluated integral. If you want to go uh, in the opposite order, you switch the variables here, y, x, and then you are integrating dx, dy. Here you would see the unevaluated integral. And you see you integrating from one branch of the parabola to the other, 0 to 1 fourth in y, dx dy. The problem I've taken from chapter 7 is a volume in spherical coordinates. So you want to integrate the function 1, so we're finding a volume over this region. What is this region? It's above the cone defined by phi equals pi over 4 and below the sphere rho equals 3 cos phi. Now that region was integrated in uh, what was drawn in example 758. So let's just see if we can picture the region. So it was drawn using plot commands, a plot 3D. This draws the sphere. This draws the cone. You put them together with the display command, and it looks like this. So the actual computation of volume takes place here. Mathematically, what you need to do is integrate in spherical coordinates. This describes this region 
in spherical coordinates. Here you have the Jacobian for integrating in spherical coordinates. There you get the value of this volume. Clearly there is prior to tackling this example a discussion of spherical coordinates. I invite you to look in the help pages for where that's described as part of this study guide. Maple's interactive solution will show you some other tools that are available. Here is a test template for visualizing integration regions in spherical coordinates. So there are six options because you have three differentials. We've picked the order d rho, d phi, d theta. That shows you where the bounds need to go. Here you have the Jacobian. Our integrand is 1 because we're calculating a volume. And here we put in the bounds. Exact value. Graph. The graph looks like what it's supposed to. Feedback is that these bounds are probably correct. There's another test template that integrates in spherical coordinates in the order d rho, d phi, d theta. You would fill in these uh, fields with the appropriate values. This command is the multi-int command. All you have to do is hit the enter key after you fill in all these fields because the equation labels are reaching up here to grab the information that you provided. Hit the enter key. You, you see here you see the output as an integral and here you see the output as a value. And here if you see output equals steps and you see the integral evaluated stepwise. The multi-int command can also be accessed through the context panel. So load the student multivariate calculus package, type the integrand 1, and from the context panel, access multivariate calculus. You'll see integrate, iterate. You get these pop-ups. First you get this one, where you specify that you're going to work in spherical coordinates. Then you get this one where you specify the bounds of the integrals. You get the unevaluated integral because we have selected here integral. And then use the context panel for evaluate integral. Evaluate this integral and you get 27 over 8 pi. And here we have simply set a triple integral from the calculus palette. It's this one, iterated triple integral, filled in the appropriate fields, and again get 27 pi upon 8. Finally, let's access the multi-int command as a, as a command. So load the student multivariate calculus package. Here's the multi-int command. We're integrating one, so we're getting volume. Here are the bounds. Coordinates equals spherical. So these are the names that we're using for the spherical coordinate axes. Rho phi theta. And the order here is important. Rho comes first. That's the radial vector, radius. Phi is the angle down from the z-axis. Theta is the angle around the z-axis. It doesn't matter what names you put here. You could put P and Q. You could put R and S. You could put uh, anything you like here. It is the order that determines what that angle or that name refers to. So the middle one refers to the angle down from the z-axis and the theta or this third 
variable refers to the angle around the z-axis. So here we say output equals integral. We get the unevaluated integral. If we don't say anything, we'll get the value. If we say output equals steps, we get the stepwise solution. And here I'm using that trick big int, little int. So this is top level, big int, little int. What you get is on the left, you get the unevaluated integral. On the right, you get the evaluated integral. Our example from chapter 8 is another integral, but it's a volume integral in cylindrical coordinates. So we're co computing the volume of this region that's bounded by two paraboloids, one sitting inside the other, and two horizontal planes, z equals 2 and z equals 3. But then there's a change of variables that changes that region, and the integral is, or the volume is, recomputed. So the initial diagnosis of the work that we have to perform is in the mathematical solution. And you can see here a graph that shows the inner paraboloid the outer paraboloid, the cutting plane, and the cutting plane. The volume bounded by those four surfaces is shown here. This is the solid whose volume we are computing. Now, we're going to work in cylindrical coordinates, and you can see x squared plus y squared is r squared. So we're going to have to describe the paraboloids as R of Z, the red one, is root Z over 2. And the green one is root Z over 3. So let's consider the actual integrals we need to set up. We're going to work in the order R, Z, theta. So in cylindrical coordinates, the Jacobian is R. So r dr dz d theta, and you're integrating from the green shell to the red shell, from the blue cutting plane to the gray cutting plane, and you got to go all the way around 0 to 2 pi. If you make the change of variables as suggested, you're going to have to compute a Jacobian. So... These are the columns of the Jacobian. This is the Jacobian matrix, but these bars need to take the determinant, and this is what you get. Well, you would use the absolute value of the Jacobian. So there is the Jacobian, du, dv, dw, and here we have computed the equivalent boundaries for the integral in terms of these coordinates u, v, and w. And here is the discussion of how we obtain these limits. So in the interactive solution and the coded solution, we evaluate this integral and this integral and show that they're the same. So let's look at the interactive solution. We begin with a task template, and we've seen we it find these test templates. This one is for visualizing regions of integration and cylindrical coordinates. Again, you have six choices of the order in which you're going to proceed. We decided to use dr, dz, d theta. So putting the Jacobian in there, r, we get the, the volume element. This is what our integral will look like. The r belongs to the Jacobian. The integrand is 1. Here is how you decide where to put the various bounds. You put them in these boxes. Press the button for the value. So you have now a first value computed for this volume. We press the graph button, and we see this picture, which corresponds to the picture we drew uh, earlier. Visual feedback that says we have probably set this integral up correctly. Now let's investigate what happens when we change coordinates. 
All right. We'll make use of the student multivariate calculus package because the first thing we want to do is compute the Jacobian in the new coordinate system. So here is a list of the transformation equations XYZ evaluated. So we're picking out the right hand sides by taking this list of XYZ, evaluating it with respect to this list, and we get the right hand sides. So in the context panel, we have an option Jacobian matrix. This is the Jacobian matrix. Then we find a place where you can, in the context panel where you can get a determinant. We simplify this and we get the Jacobian that we stated in the mathematical solution to be the appropriate Jacobian, but we'll have to take an absolute value of that. Having obtained the Jacobian, we now have to apply those transformations to the bounding surfaces. So here we take one of the paraboloids. Here we take one of the cutting planes. Here we take the other paraboloid. And here we take the other cutting plane. That allows us to write the iterated triple integral i've used the uh, i've used the palette the calculus palette to get the template for this triple integral i formulate the triple integral according to the information i've generated here and i get the same 25 over 72 pi the coded solution or you can see the maple commands we make use of top level int with a capital I and int with a small i. With a capital I, you get the unevaluated integral. With small i, you get the value. You see here we've put in the r, not a 1. We've put in the r so that we get the Jacobian in cylindrical coordinates. And we get the appropriate answer, 25 over 72 pi. Now we want to uh, make these tr uh, transformation equations active. So we'll work with student multivariate calculus package. Here are the transformation equations. We're going to use them to obtain the Jacobian. So we pick off the right-hand sides, right-hand sides, by evaluating the list x, y, z with respect to these equations, the result is these right-hand sides. These are the variables we're computing Jacobian. And we want the output of this Jacobian command to be the determinant rather than the Jacobian matrix. We get the same expression we had earlier. Then we have to transform each of the bounding surfaces so here are one, two, three, four bounding surfaces transformed. And then we use the top level int commands. Again, this is the Jacobian for this new system of coordinates. Here are the bounds. Here is the unevaluated integral. Here is the value of that. It's again 25 over 72 pi. For a problem out of chapter 9, I've chosen this one, an illustration of the divergence theorem. So you instantiate the divergence theorem just to see how it works. So we need a vector field. So I've picked this for the vector field, the three-dimensional vector field. Uh, and you need a region. It's a cylinder. And so the cylinder is going to have a top and a bottom because you need a closed region. So this is an example we are looking at the mathematics first is helpful, extremely helpful. We need the divergence of the vector field because that's what gets integrated on the left of the divergence theorem. Divergence is simple to compute. It turns out to be the constant 3. So we're going to integrate over the interior using cylindrical coordinates. So there's R is the Jacobian for cylindrical coordinates, dz dr d theta, 3 integrated, there are your bounds, you get 3 pi. So the left of the divergent left side of the divergence theorem 
3 pi. Now, right side is a computation of flux. There are three surfaces to consider. These are the wall of the cylinder, is the top of the cylinder, is the bottom of the cylinder. You've got to compute the flux through each of those three surfaces. We need on the wall of the cylinder the outward normal. So we can get that by taking the cross product of these basis vectors. There's n. And this looks right. We recollect what the uh, vector cos theta sine theta looks like. That looks right. f dot n. That's what you're computing on the wall of the cylinder to get the flux. So here's f dot n. Turns out it's 1. So we can write the integral for flux on the wall of the cylinder. You get 2 pi. Now you got to deal with the top and the bottom. On the top, the outward normal is k. So f dot n is z. But z equals 1 on top of the cylinder. So here is the integral over the disk on top, cylindrical coordinates, or well, polar coordinates here, r d r d theta, you get pi. On the bottom, the outward normal is minus k, but z equals 0 on that bottom surface. So there's no contribution from the bottom. So 2 pi here and pi here will match the 3 pi we computed here. So the Maple Interactive Solution has some tools. We will work in the uh, vector calculus package first, and then we'll work in multivariate calculus, and we'll load them uh, one after, not at the same time, but, but stagger that to avoid conflicts. So one thing that we want here is to have the display of vectors as column vectors, not as sums over basis vectors. Then we have to um, define the vector field f. And we do that by writing it first as a free vector. And then you convert that to a vector field using the context panel. And then we give it the name f. Del dot f, the divergence can be computed by using the NABLA. Now, mine's in the favorites palette, but you can find it in the common symbols palette right there. Use the NABLA to compute del dot f, and you get 3. And some of those devices, like where is the NABLA and so forth, you would find information like that in the appendix. So we're going to integrate 3 over the interior of this region. And to do that, we load the multivariate calculus package because that will do integrals with the multi int command. You write 3, you go to the context panel, you find integrate, iterated. Now we've seen that before, so that's familiar. Uh, you fill out these di dialogues that come up. Here are two dialogues. Cylindrical coordinates. You fill in the bounds. We want to see the integral. That's why this returns the integral. Evaluate the integral from using the context panel. Evaluate integral. 3 pi. So the left-hand side of this divergence theorem example, 3 pi. To get the flux through the wall of the cylinder, going to use this task template. Here's the path to it. Coordinate system, set it, vector field, components, x, y, z. Define the surface. We're in cylindrical coordinates. And the coordinate bounds 0, theta, 2 pi, 0, z, 1. Click continue, and then this set of fields opens up. So R theta, R of theta and Z is 1, the wall of the cylinder. Theta is theta, Z is Z. Click continue, then these two fields open up. 
you click flux integral and you see what the flux integral this should have been simplified to one you obtain the value of that there's your two pi so the flux through the wall of the cylinder two pi to obtain the flux through the top of the cylinder the, the lid on top we'll make use of this test template pick the coordinate system and set it vector field now the surface is defined parametrically x is x y is y z is 1 the center and radius of the disk 0 0 1 flux integral is given here its value is given here corresponds to what we saw earlier the flux through the top of the cylinder is pi we can use the same test template to get the flux through the bottom of the cylinder the disk on the bottom coordinate system vector field define the, the surface x is x y is y z is zero the center of the disk zero zero radius of the disk one you'll notice here the flux integral as a zero integrand clearly the value of the flux at the bottom is zero so three pi on the left two pi plus pi on the right they balance out three pi equals three pi also let's now look at the coded solution let's get the volume integral on the left first so we'll work in the student vector calculus package this command basis format is the one that sets the display of vectors the default is to have them as sums over basis vectors so setting that default to false means vectors will display as column vectors you can get the vector field with the vector field command f is now a vector field you can use the divergence command compute the divergence comes out to be three there are integration commands in the vector calculus package int has been modified within that package to behave differently from the way it does at top level it understands certain regions and the generic region is the word region XYZ coordinates region you give the ranges corresponding to these variables if you say output equals integral you will see the unevaluated integral there's your three dz dy dx so I'm doing this in Cartesian coordinates if you don't have output equals integral you will get to three pi, three pi next we want to obtain the flux now we will use the flux command in the vector calculus package the flux command requires that you have a vector field and you have something to integrate over so the surface is generic and the surface is given parametrically by a vector s that describes the surface so here is that vector s it's in cylindrical coordinates 1 theta z so that'll be the wall of the surface so I'm computing the flux over this surface and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi z goes from 0 to 1 that completes the definition of that surface and I'm going to have the output be an integral then I'm going to add on the flux through the top so the top is described in x y z coordinates and z equals one so x and y trace out a circle whose center is zero zero and radius is one this r and theta says to maple use r and theta as the variables when you display this output equals integral and then for the bottom you just change the one to a zero and you get the unevaluated integrals here to cosine squared plus sine squared is one r d theta dr zero if you take away the output equals integral and you sum those 
three commands, you get three pi, which was the total flux on the right side of the divergence theorem. We know that three pi on the left is the volume integral. Two pi, three pi equals three pi. This is the verification or the instantiation of the divergence theorem for this example.